In 2018, at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., was a special exhibit centered on a rare Bible from the 1880s that was used by British missionaries to convert and educate slaves. What's notable about this Bible is not just its rarity, but its content, or rather the lack of content. It excludes any portion of text that might inspire rebellion or liberation. This was the Slave Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God as at the time meant to guide us through our lives on earth. The Slave Bible was different from the Bible we know today. It was used as a tool for propaganda, supported by ministers who claimed to speak for God. It might surprise you to learn that some who preached love and holiness believed that God had cursed a certain race because of the color of their skin. But what exactly did the Slave Bible contain? Which passages were promoted and which ones were left out? And the most significant question of all, why did it even exist? In this video, we will answer all your questions and shine a light on a time when religion was used to spread falsehoods and hatred. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. Prior to their abduction and enslavement, Africans were not monolithic in their religious beliefs. Rather, they practiced a rich tapestry of spiritual traditions that varied across regions, ethnic groups, and cultures. These traditions included animism, ancestor worship, and polytheism, all of which were deeply connected to the natural world and the spirits inhabiting it. Additionally, many Africans had embraced Islam through contact with Arab traders and travelers. This introduction to Islam resulted in the conversion of various African communities to the faith. Thus, when Africans were uprooted from their homelands, they brought with them a diverse array of spiritual beliefs and practices. Upon their arrival in the New World, enslaved Africans were confronted with a starkly different religious landscape, one dominated by Christianity. Missionaries and slave owners sought to convert enslaved individuals to Christianity as part of their efforts to assert control and justify the institution of slavery. The promise of salvation, eternal life, and spiritual salvation was used as both a carrot and a stick. Conversion could offer some semblance of hope and comfort in the face of unimaginable suffering, while simultaneously serving as a means of asserting authority over the enslaved. Africans were brought to Christian congregations where they were exposed to the teachings and rituals of the faith. This exposure marked the beginning of a spiritual transformation that would unfold over generations. As African individuals became members of Christian congregations, their traditional religious practices began to merge with elements of Christianity. It was in this context of spiritual upheaval and vulnerability that the Slave Bible emerged. The Slave Bible, produced in the early 19th century, was a carefully edited and censored version of the Bible, with significant portions omitted. While the Bible is traditionally seen as a source of inspiration, liberation, and moral guidance, this manipulated version sought to erase passages that might challenge the status quo or inspire thoughts of rebellion and emancipation. Today, there are only three known copies of the Slave Bible in existence. One copy belongs to Fisk University, and the other two are located in the United Kingdom. The original Slave Bible was published by Law and Gilbert Publishing House in London, and the copy belonging to Fisk University was published the following year. It was published on behalf of the Society for the Conversion of Negro Slaves to educate enslaved Africans and preserve the system of slavery. The first slave Bible was published in 1807, three years after the Haitian Revolution ended. That revolution was the only slave revolt in history in which enslaved people successfully drove out their European oppressors to form a new nation, and it increased American and European paranoia that the people they oppressed would one day rise up against them. 
The Haitian Revolution could have been a motivation for publishing a Bible without the part where Moses tells the Pharaoh to let my people go. Missionaries and planters may have thought that Christianity, at least certain parts of it, would protect against revolutions by teaching enslaved people to respect their masters. Slaveholders and colonial authorities recognized the potential threat posed by a literate enslaved population. They feared that if Africans had access to the complete Bible, they might find inspiration for resistance, liberation, and equality within its pages. To ensure this doesn't happen, certain passages within the context of the slave Bible were meticulously selected to promote the idea of submission and obedience among the enslaved population. These passages were wielded as powerful tools to reinforce the notion that servitude was not only a worldly duty, but also a divine mandate. One of such was the curse of Ham in the book of Genesis in the words of the King James Bible, which was the version then current. These were first, Genesis 9, 18 to 27. And the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. While the biblical account itself raises questions and challenges, it was the distorted and popularized version known as the Curse of Ham that became a foundational text for those seeking to justify the enslavement of Africans on purportedly biblical grounds. The original story mentions that Canaan, the son of Ham, would bear the curse. However, in The Curse of Ham, Canaan's name is omitted. This omission allowed for a broader application of the curse to all of Ham's descendants. Ham was portrayed as black in The Curse of Ham. This portrayal was a misinterpretation of the biblical text, which provided no description of Ham's physical appearance. This false characterization was used to associate Ham and his descendants with Africans. Building on the false portrayal of Ham, his descendants were broadly identified as Africans. This identification, devoid of any biblical basis, was used to justify the enslavement of African people. The curse of Ham was utilized to argue that God had ordained the enslavement of Africans as punishment for Ham's supposed sin of seeing his father's nakedness. This distorted interpretation provided a religious justification for the brutal practice of slavery. The curse of Ham found a receptive audience among those seeking to rationalize the enslavement of African individuals. Proponents of slavery, particularly in the American context, wielded this misinterpretation as a powerful tool to perpetuate their agenda. It was disseminated through literature, sermons, and other means infiltrating the collective consciousness of societies. The consequences of this distorted narrative were profound and devastating. It contributed to the dehumanization of African people and the establishment of systems of racial hierarchy. African individuals were viewed as cursed by divine decree, perpetuating their status as chattel and justifying the horrific abuses inflicted upon them. In addition to this, there are other passages used to enforce slavery and encourage obedience. Some of these include Ephesians 6, 5, which says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, 
as you would Christ. This verse from the New Testament is perhaps one of the most frequently cited passages in the slave Bible to encourage obedience. The verse implies that obedience to earthly masters is akin to serving Christ himself. This interpretation elevated servitude to a sacred duty, fostering the belief that compliance with enslavers was not merely a matter of social order, but also a religious obligation. Enslaved Africans were taught that by serving their masters diligently and sincerely, they were not only fulfilling their earthly duties, but also earning favor in the eyes of God. This deeply ingrained spiritual coercion had a profound impact on their psyche. It left them torn between the desire for spiritual redemption and the yearning for earthly freedom. Another verse is Colossians 3.22, which says, Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. This is another passage from the New Testament. Reinforce the theme of unwavering obedience. It admonished enslaved individuals to obey their masters in all matters, not merely when under close scrutiny or to please others, Instead, they were urged to carry out their servitude with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. The interpretation of this passage emphasized that even in the absence of direct supervision, enslaved individuals were to remain steadfast in their obedience. The fear of the Lord was invoked to underscore the gravity of this command, further deepening the sense of spiritual duty. Slaveholders recognized the power of religion in shaping the beliefs and actions of enslaved Africans. By emphasizing these passages, they aimed to legitimize their oppressive system and dissuade any thoughts of rebellion or resistance. The message was clear. Obedience was not only expected but divinely mandated, a message carefully curated to maintain control over those in bondage. These carefully selected passages played a pivotal role in shaping the psychological landscape of enslaved Africans. The constant exposure to such teachings instilled a complex web of emotions and beliefs. On one hand, they grappled with the desire to attain spiritual salvation and please a divine entity. On the other hand, they faced the harsh reality of subjugation and the yearning for personal freedom. The dichotomy between their spiritual obligations and their human aspirations left many enslaved individuals in a state of inner turmoil. They found themselves torn between their duties as defined by the slave Bible and their inity longing for autonomy and equality. In the troubling history of the slave Bible, the promotion and distribution of this modified text were not limited to enslavers alone. Rather, it saw the involvement of various religious figures, including bishops, pastors, and missionaries who, perhaps paradoxically, lent their support to this distorted version of the Holy Scriptures. Among these figures, Reverend C. F. Morgan, a prominent Anglican bishop in Jamaica, stood out as a key advocate for the slave Bible. To comprehend the scope of his endorsement and that of other religious leaders, we must delve into the complex motivations and justifications behind their actions. The Anglican Bishop, Reverend C. F. Morgan, played a pivotal role in the dissemination of the slave Bible, particularly in the context of Jamaica. His endorsement of this modified scripture raised important questions about the intersections of faith, power, and social control during the era of slavery. Morgan's support for the slave Bible was rooted in his belief that it served as a tool for maintaining social order and control among the enslaved population. To comprehend his perspective, we must consider the broader context in which he operated. During the period of slavery, religion was often employed both as a means of subjugation and as a source of hope and resistance. Enslaved individuals were exposed to Christian teachings but the interpretation of these teachings varied widely. On one hand, there were religious leaders like Morgan who espoused a view of Christianity that reinforced existing power structures. 
They saw the modified Bible as a way to legitimize the institution of slavery, emphasizing obedience, submission, and servitude as religious duties. In their eyes, this interpretation not only maintained social order, but also provided a spiritual rationale for the oppressive system. Morgan's support for the slave Bible underscores the power dynamics at play during this tumultuous period. As a religious authority figure, his words held immense sway over the enslaved population. By endorsing this distorted text, he effectively reinforced the existing hierarchy, with enslavers at the top and the enslaved at the bottom. The use of religion to justify slavery was not unique to Morgan or the Anglican Church. Across denominations, there were individuals who used their religious authority to endorse and perpetuate the institution of slavery. Most of these individuals focused on the curse of Ham and supported the interpretation, and often used it to legitimize the enslavement of Africans and to reinforce racial hierarchies. They believed that the curse of Ham justified the subjugation of black people and their enslavement by white Europeans and Americans. The likes of Reverend Alexander MacLeod is a famous example. Reverend Alexander MacLeod was a prominent Presbyterian minister in the United States during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In his influential pamphlet, Negro Slavery Unjustifiable, published in 1802, MacLeod argued that slavery was not only justifiable, but also part of God's divine plan. He invoked the curse of Ham as biblical support for his argument. MacLeod contended that Ham's descendants were cursed by God, and this curse extended to black Africans. He believed that this curse justified their enslavement as a form of divine punishment. MacLeod's pamphlet was widely circulated and contributed to the theological underpinnings of pro-slavery arguments within the Christian community. Another is Reverend Richard Furman. Reverend Richard Furman was a prominent Baptist minister in the early 19th century, known for his strong defense of slavery. In 1822, he wrote a letter to South Carolina Governor John Drayton, in which he articulated his views on slavery and its compatibility with Christian principles. Furman asserted that slavery was not inconsistent with Christian morality and cited the curse of Ham as biblical justification for the enslavement of black people. He argued that the institution of slavery was ordained by God and that it served as a means to bring enslaved Africans to Christianity. Forman's letter added religious legitimacy to the pro-slavery stance and reinforced the belief that slavery was a divine institution. Another Baptist minister known as Reverend Thornton Stringfellow would agree with Foreman. In 1856, he authored a pamphlet titled Scriptural and Statistical Views in Favor of Slavery. This pamphlet aimed to provide a biblical and statistical defense of slavery. Stringfellow used numerous biblical passages, including those related to the curse of Ham, to argue that slavery was not only consistent with Christian teachings, but also divinely ordained. He contended that black Africans were descendants of Ham and, as such, were destined to be servants. Stringfellow's pamphlet sought to bolster the pro-slavery argument within the religious community. Even the Presbyterian Church was in on it. Reverend Josiah Priest was a Presbyterian minister and author who penned the book Bible Defense of Slavery in 1851. In this book, Priest aimed to provide a comprehensive biblical defense of slavery, drawing upon various passages from the Bible. Like the other religious leaders mentioned, Priest invoked the curse of Ham as evidence of God's approval of slavery. He argued that the enslavement of black people was in line with God's divine plan and that slaveholders were acting in accordance with biblical principles. Bible defense of slavery was part of the broader pro-slavery literature that used religious arguments to support the institution of slavery. These religious leaders and their writings played a significant role in shaping the theological and moral landscape of the pro-slavery movement in the United States.
Their interpretations of biblical passages, particularly those related to the curse of Ham, provided religious justifications for the enslavement of black Africans and contributed to the deeply entrenched system of slavery in the country. The Slave Bible didn't only focus on passages that enforced obedience, suppressed rebellion, and ensured the continued subjugation of enslaved African populations, but it also deliberately omitted several passages to prevent the inspiration of freedom, equality, and justice among the oppressed. One of the most glaring omissions from the Slave Bible was the Book of Exodus. This deliberate exclusion was far from accidental. It was a calculated strategy aimed at erasing a story that embodied the pursuit of freedom and the triumph of justice. In Exodus, the narrative unfolds as the Israelites, enslaved in Egypt, seek liberation under the guidance of Moses. Their journey from bondage to freedom, marked by miraculous events and divine intervention, has resonated with oppressed people throughout history. The removal of Exodus from the Slave Bible was strategic because it contained powerful themes that could have inspired enslaved Africans to aspire to their own emancipation. The story of God's justice, His intervention on behalf of the oppressed, and the ultimate escape from tyranny was a narrative that slaveholders feared would embolden those in bondage. The omission of Exodus effectively deprived enslaved Africans of a tale that could have fueled their desire for liberation. Within the complete Bible, there are verses that emphasize freedom, justice, and the call to resist oppression. These verses were anathema to slaveholders, as they posed a direct challenge to the institution of slavery. Galatians 3.28, for instance, proclaims, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This powerful message of equality among believers directly contradicted the racial hierarchy and the legitimacy of slavery. The Slave Bible doesn't include Moses leading the Israelites to freedom, but it does include Joseph's enslavement in Egypt. In the U.S., some sermons aimed at enslaved people portrayed Joseph as someone who accepts his lot in life, keeps his faith in God, and in the end is rewarded for it. The Slave Bible may have wanted to impart a similar lesson to its audience. In the Slave Bible, such verses were ruthlessly excluded to prevent any suggestion of equality among enslaved individuals. The deliberate omission of these passages aimed to maintain a rigid hierarchy where slaveholders could justify their dominance and argue that divine approval lay with the institution of slavery. By silencing these messages of freedom and equality, the oppressors sought to maintain control over the minds and spirits of the enslaved. The Slave Bible stands as a reminder of how religion can be twisted and manipulated to justify cruelty and oppression. Ministers and pastors use the Word of God to support the inhumane institution of slavery, promoting a distorted message of obedience and submission among the enslaved population. While the Slave Bible exists today as a historical artifact, it serves as a proof to the lengths some individuals went to uphold their unjust practices. It reminds us of the importance of critical thinking and questioning even when religious authority is invoked to promote harmful ideologies. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comments section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.